Welcome to the Uncensored Society Podcast, where guests share their insights, experiences, and tactics to help you accelerate your business. So building, scaling, and monetizing your business is made easier. And now, your host, Kay Suthar. Oh my goodness, guys. Welcome to Uncensored Society Podcast, and I am so excited for this episode. We today have an awesome guest, and I know I say that every time I have an episode, but every single one of my guests are awesome. But today is extra special. His name is George Morris. He's a certified scaling up coach and a lifelong entrepreneur. He has walked the entrepreneur's journey from zero business experience and starting up during and awful economic conditions in the dot-com crash. And then he's built his business to a place where it's at its best and its fast-growing company, George happily shares his mistakes and lessons learned to the rest of the world, to his clients, to anyone that would spend some time and actually speak with him. George is adamant that business fundamental unlocks the potential of teams and organization. I mean, how true is that, guys? He lives just outside of Boulder, Colorado, with two of his kids and can often be found riding his bikes on the mountains and roads of Colorado. Please welcome to the show, George Morris, head coach. Oh my goodness, I am so excited for you to be here, George. I'm excited too now. I want to meet this George guy you're talking about. (laughs) Oh my goodness. You know what? You and I had a conversation prior to this episode, right? A couple of days ago. And Mm -hmm. from what you were telling me and how you serve your clients in the world and with your experiences and the, the golden nuggets of knowledge that you have, I was like, I need to have you on the show. Like It was a no brainer. And so I really want to get into the nitty gritty of what you do and what your business is. But before we get into all of that, I would love for you to share with all the listeners, you know, what were you doing before you got into the world of business and how did that transition begin? Yeah. Hey, thanks, Kay. Um, You know, it is early this morning. It's 6 a.m. my time. And I feel like just hanging out and talking to you is better than my cup of coffee that I got here. I feel more energized. So this (laughs) Get a little cup of K in the morning. Um, (laughs) So what was I doing uh, before I got into the whole into the business and how I got into business? So I grew up, uh, my father had a construction company and he owned it. Right. So I got to watch my father work. And my father said to me at a very young age, got me outside doing construction. He goes, George, it's so much easier to push a pencil than it is to hammer a nail. He goes, you don't want to do this. You don't want to be doing construction late into your life. I'm like, well, fair point. (laughs) Noted with my five-year-old mind or six-year-old mind. Um, So I always grew up thinking I want to have a business. I want to do something I control that I have agency over. And when I came out of college, my background in college, by the way, was environmental studies, right? Like totally not related to anything that I do today, right? But the college education was great. And I ended up joining a company. I tried starting a company, miserably failed my first year, right? I made a whopping $600 my first year in business. Wow. Okay. All <laughs> so right. I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Like this is, this is, <laughs> this is so foreign to me and joined a company for a little while a year. That company went under during the dot-com crash. And then I started business and Since that point, it's been all about trial and error, listening to other people, figuring out what they're doing well, stealing ideas from other people, making them my own, and innovating along the way. And it's been an amazing journey. I I hope it's going to be just as amazing going forward. Right. Oh, my goodness. And you know what? I just want to just mention something you just said, stealing other people's ideas and turning it into your own right? A lot of people will be like, oh my God, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be copying other people's ideas. Oh my goodness, guys, in school, when you copy, it's called plagiarism. In business, (laughs) it's called success, right? Copy other successful people. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Why change the will when it doesn't need to be changed and it works? Right? So there's nothing wrong with that. And I just want to make that clear to everybody that's listening to this episode that the that's what you should be doing to have a successful business. 
Yeah, I mean, we you're standing on the backs of those that came before you. And I think that's one of the things I love, one of the many things I love with the scaling up community of the other coaches that are in the pro in this program with me. Mm-hmm. And we do it all the time. I mean, it's 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 so blatant. We'll get on and we'll share something. Like I have a tool and I'll be like, hey, Kay, I will share this tool with you. And then you bring in some other coaches that are in the program uh, that do the same program I do. And they're like, George, we love that. Uh, can you send me the files? I'm like, sure, right. I'll send you the files. I know full well what they're going to do is take the files, drop their logo on it, mix some things up and make it their own. And I'm going to do the same. And that's how we get better. We're not protective. And, you know, I think that's one of the things um, you're familiar with Simon Sinek, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. He's great. And I think he's also British, if I'm not mistaken. Right. But he so Simon Sinek's whole idea is that, you know, you can't protect some of this stuff. It makes no sense to protect this stuff and get competitive with each other. Instead, how do we collaborate with each other? Right. Instead of competing, how do we collaborate? How do we make each other better? How do we add to the body of knowledge? Right. How do we support each other? That's our way forward. Not this like cutthroat protective way of doing things that's exactly right it's all about helping others in the world right the best that you can serving them and it is the 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 law reciprocity why am i saying words that i can't love reciprocity see i was struggling with it too yeah (laughs) there we go right and so that's what makes business go around that's what makes the world go around Mm-hmm. Right. And so Absolutely. I totally agree with that. So, George, tell me something um, regards to your business. How do you specifically help your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. Every one of my clients is all over the board. Right. So I have some clients that are maybe a million dollars, a few clients okay. at a million dollars. I have a few clients north of one hundred million dollars. That's a really wide, vast yeah. set of possibilities. However, the one thing that's consistent is that the clients I work with have a leadership team, right? So they have their executive team. I only have one client that is a, that is a solopreneur, and that, that's an experiment to see how I can do it with a solopreneur. Interesting. But okay. they all have executive teams. And so it's me coming in with the owner, the founder, the president, the, the top person that's in the company, and then working to get their entire team in alignment with each other. Like, just because you say you're fixing or building widgets, and you have this particular revenue goal, and you've hired these type of A players or whatever type of players you've hired, does not mean anything. It just means you got some people together working towards something. What I'm trying to do is I come in with the companies and I get them aligned to where they need to go. And it, it really, honestly, Kay, is like such a simple concept of what I do is just getting alignment and getting them down to the the fundamentals and the basics that it's almost embarrassingly simple to explain. It's incredibly difficult to execute. That's the difference. Wow. Okay. So I'm assuming here, now correct me if I'm wrong, that those people that say are making $100,000 in the business and those that are making a million dollars plus are going to have different sets of challenges in the business. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Different set of challenges, yep. So, but my thinking is if you are making a million dollars plus, then clearly you have got a structure. You There there can't be any challenges or issues that you're facing if you're making that kind of money anyway, right? It might be perfect. Yeah, you would think, right? I mean, that's what we like to think is that it's all perfect (laughs) once you're making that. I, what happens is that uh, you can succeed despite those things that aren't working, right? So you're only going to you're only going to grow as fast as your weakest link, right? So there's going to be elements within the company that are just not going to work well. And you're going to eventually cap off because those things are going to become such an anchor to your ability to grow. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times it's the leadership team, right? If you think about a bottle, the bottleneck is at the top of the bottle, right? right? Yeah. And so it's the leadership team. It's usually the CEO, the president, the founder, the leadership team at the top of that bottle, choking it from growing anymore. Interesting. The way I look at it is this way, right? The company is just an amplification of the leadership, right? So at the top, if the leadership team is not functioning and the CEO, the president, whoever is in there has had enough time to instill their fingerprint on them, they're going to act a certain way. They're going to act similar 
to the person in charge. And then that executive team is going to be amplified by the team around them in the business, yeah. right? So what we have to do is we have to unwind that. We got to go back up into the executive team and figure out where's the dysfunction in the executive team. So really great book um, is by Patrick Leccioni. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And it starts with trust. Once you actually get trust nailed down, then the rest of it can be built upon itself. But so many teams don't realize that they don't trust each other. And when you don't trust each other, all kinds of bad things happen when you don't trust each other, but nobody sees. They, they like each other and they say they trust each other. But when I test them and run them through some surveys, they don't trust each other. Most teams. That's, that's really interesting. Okay. So why do they not trust each other? Where does that come from? I, I, I can't speak to each individual, but uh, generally speaking, it's just building building a career of – uh, acting a particular way, working a particular way, at least in the United States, what I've seen okay. is that there's a lot of people that are, uh, when we hire people, generally speaking, the concept in the United States seems to be is we don't want to hire people better than us because it undermines my job security to hire somebody better than me. But what I've noticed, and this was the, my observation when I was when I was in Europe for a little bit, I noticed that Europeans tend to hire people better than them. Generally speaking, the idea is like, I'm making a better company. I want to bring in better talent. But I feel like in the United States, that's not quite true. Interesting. Okay. So it sounds like they have a fear of others coming in later on and progressing ahead of them. Yeah, sure. And it's, and it's, it, it is, it's putting better people in front of you for one. Um, I think that's one of the things. There's many others. I think it's also this idea of, um, I have to be right. I have to have all the answers. And if I'm wrong and I ask for help, that somehow that's a weakness. And I can't have any weakness. I can't show weakness. I can't show that I need help because then people are going to lose confidence in me. And ironically, it is exactly the other way around. Oh, that, that is super cool. And do you know what? In fact, one of the things that I've learned with my team right, is that when you do build a team and you, you want to build them to be the best that they can, even if they are better at you in certain aspects, right, that's exactly right. what you want. And I've That's now what they want too. Right. I've turned around to my team and I'm like, okay, I may own this company, but you guys are my boss. You guys mm -hmm. tell me what to do, when to do it, how to do it, right, because they're better at that than I am. Right. All I have to right. do is execute, right? And they, they think I'm absolutely mad when I tell them this, but I'm like, that's exactly what it is, and that's what I want. I want them to be my boss. Right, right. I'm and you're you're looking boss. at it exactly the right way. You know, you look at um, you look at a highly functioning team. The job of the CEO, uh, you know, again, I'll go back to Simon Sinek. He points out he's like a really great CEO. When you ask them, what is your job? A lot of them come back and say, oh, talk to customers, find out what the customers are doing. And then he pointed out, he's like, no, that's actually bullshit. Your job is not to talk to customers. You haven't probably talked to a customer in months. Your job <laughs> is to work with the employees, right? Like your job is to go to the employees and say, hey, Kay, well, uh, you're doing a great job today. What can I do to help you out? What things could I change in your workplace to make your job better? And that's the same way that you're approaching it. It's that servant leader attitude of, I'm here to help you knock down roadblocks so that you can get your shit done more effectively. Yes. Not the other way around, which is I have all the great ideas and you little minions need to go take my ideas and make them happen. And when you fail, I'm going to berate you because you've been bad, right? Like right. bad, wrong concept, totally wrong concept. You know what? And that's how, and I've seen this happen to people. I've seen it happen. And this is where you start losing great team members. Mm-hmm. Right. And the minute Absolutely. that happens, then everything just starts going downhill. And it is all because of your attitude. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Depending on which direction you want to go down, you can either build your business the best that it can or it will go downhill very, very quickly. Has that been have you seen the same thing happen? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I see it with teams that <clears throat> they, they have a mediocre team. Right. And they bring in an A player. Right. And now an A player, you hear people say that a lot. They'll be like an A player, an A player. It's like, well, what's the definition of an A player? Right. right? 
A player is somebody who's going to join the team. They're going to fall in alignment. They're going to have great ideas. They're going to execute well. They're going to be a great team player, right? So somebody else comes up with an idea. They're going to encourage the idea if it's a good idea. If it's not a good idea, they're going to go ahead and call them out and say, hey, you know, in a nice way, not you idiot, but in a really nice way, like, I don't know if that's really the best choice. And they're going to, they're going to work in alignment with the company. Um, what ends up happening is if you have a team of people that are C players that are not motivated the same way, they're going to all try to pull each other down along the way. And when you bring the A player in, the A player is going to say, I don't want to work with these people. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not, they, A players want to work with A players. And mm -hmm. when they continually work with people who are C players, they can get dejected and they can move on. So to me, the best teams are the ones that see this and they bring in an A player and they bring in another A player and they bring in another A player. And then when the C oh. players start barking, oh, this company is looking a lot different than when I joined or things are a little different here. I'm not really liking it. It's like, great. There's a door right over here. Don't let it hit you in the ass on the way out, by the way. <laughs> right. Well, I right? like that. I like that. Yes. It's that like you either get with it or you leave, go elsewhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. And it's so fun because um, I was having a conversation with you earlier about me going to the gym and having a coach and all of this stuff. And she complains about the same thing because she's also the gym manager. Right. And the thing is, she's not just a manager. She treats the gym like it's her own. She takes mm -hmm. care of it. If people start messing around and leaving their coats and bags all over the shop, she's going to go over there and tell you. Mm -hmm. Right. And she's like, but her team will sit there, watch what's happening and not do anything about it. And it absolutely drives her potty. Right. And so when things like that happen, right, when your team players, you know, that you love to death are not doing the things that they want to do because, and the reason for this, because they want to be liked. They don't want mm, to tell mm -hmm. people because they want to be liked. How do you then overcome that? Mm, that is a fantastic question, okay? Because each team has various dynamics on it. And what I do is I sit down with the executive team and I disc profile them, right? So oh. disc profiling gives me a way to look at the way they think, right? So it's 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 not going to tell me everything about them. I can get two different profiles and they, I can get two of the same profiles and the people look entirely different, act entirely different. But what it tells me is that they think similar to each other about problems, about their value, about what's important to them. Yeah. So your question was the people that want to be liked, right? And in the disc profile, that would be me. I'm, I'm one of those people in the disc profile. So there's a, a D, an I, an S, a C. The I is influence. And the I's greatest fear is social rejection, right? Interesting. And that, therefore, they, they want to make sure that everybody likes them because their greatest fear is to be, re, is to be rejected by that team. Now, on that executive team, there are going to be other, other personality types. There's going to be a C. And the C person um, is consistency, right? So now consistency is more data oriented. They're not going to be touchy feely. They're not going to give a crap about if I want to be liked or not liked. They're going to come back to me and say, George, did you make the numbers last week? Uh, I'll say, yep, I made the numbers. Cool. Keep doing what you got to do. You might be personally an idiot in terms of how you relate to people socially, but you're getting the job done numerically, Okay. okay. right? Okay. Then you got the D and the D is a really high dominance, right? So theirs is, this is what we're going to do. And this is why we're going to do it. And you need to listen to me and just move out of the way. So uh -huh. it's about getting shit done with the D, but a high D is a steamroller. They'll crush you in their path. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. Right. Uh, so you know, when I, and when I look at a team, I'm doing the assessment and I'm getting a picture of how the team looks and I'm saying, okay, Kay, you're over here. You know, you're a high I or, you know, your controller, your financial person is a high S or a high C. And now I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you a rubric on how you guys can communicate better. So these are the things you need to do. Uh, so like, one of the one of the lessons from one of my other coaches I really love is there's a list of 10 things on each side, ways to communicate, ways not to communicate. And you sit down with somebody who is a different profile than you and you go through and you circle. You say, 
circle two things that you want me to do to communicate with you. I'm going to circle two things that I want you to do to communicate with me. And then you get one more where you can make a request of me that may not be on my list. And now I'm going to do the same for you. And just those five bullets with each other really helps to get past that communication barrier and start to start to gel a team better. Interesting. Okay. So this is all good stuff. So you're looking at different people's personality that's on the team. And thinking, thinking style. Thinking style. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. And so is it good to have say all D's, all I's, all C's, or do we need to have that mixture? Because it sounds like having that mixture can complicate a lot of different things. But if you have all D's, for example, they'll all be thinking the same way. Yeah, it's it. You know, it's the it's the old adage: too many chefs in the kitchen, right? Oh. When you get somebody that is alike with other people, and you get a bunch of the same type of thinking, um, you run into lots of blind spots, right? So, okay. uh, a company that's really high DI. So uh, influence and dominance, they're going to be a really fun bunch because they're going to be very social, very gregarious. And that side of the disc profile is what they call the tell. They're going to tell everybody what to do. They're not going to ah, listen. Interesting. Okay. They're your sales, your marketing, your social yeah. group, and they're going to tell everybody what to do, but they're <laughs> not going to listen. They're not going to care too much for data. They're going to trust their gut feeling and they're going to drive on, which is going to make them blind to lots of other things. Now, on the flip side of that, you're going to get the other side, which is the, the SC. If you get a team of all SCs, they're going to be data heads and they're going to be all about numbers and they're going to be looking at the numbers. They're going to the, the company is going to lack heart because they're not going to care about some of those warm, fuzzy things. They're going to be so focused on the numbers and making the numbers change that they're not going to give anything to the the heart of the company and so yeah. you need in my opinion you need them all because when you have them all together or a variety of them you can look after each other's blind spots and weaknesses and catch things the other team doesn't know but with that comes the complicated task of gelling and aligning and that's why you give me a call okay i see all right so it's better to have a mixture of people on the team with different thinking processes because we need to fill the gaps in the business is what I'm hearing yeah. from you. Yeah. And the gaps in each other's thinking. Okay. Now that sounds all very well and easy if the team are willing to be coached that way, if they're willing to work with each other that way. But then what happens, George, when you get that one person that, like, nope, you're not going to tell me how I'm going to do this. I've been doing it like this for years. That's where you boot them. Boot. Right. Okay. Now, I don't know in your experiences, but I've known a few CEOs, entrepreneurs that just don't like having that conversation. There's a lot. Yeah. Right. There's Again, a lot. They, they want to be liked by everybody. So they don't want to have those hard conversations. But then if mm -hmm. they don't, then their business is going to keep facing roadblocks. So Absolutely. how do you deal with those CEOs and try and break them out of that fear or, or the dislike of not having that conversation with their staff? That's a fantastic question, Kay. Really, it comes down to getting them oriented and getting them looking at the right goal and the things needed to get to that goal. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deviate a little bit here. Okay. So one of the things I do with the company is I work on, uh, I work on this concept called a BHAG, which is by Jim Collins. He was okay. a professor at Stanford. Um, he's a professor here in University of Colorado, right down the road. And he wrote a book called Good to Great. Mm -hmm. And it's been a popular business book since like 2002, I believe. So the idea of a BHAG is they, they and I hate this name, big, hairy, audacious goal, right? Like, ah, okay. Big, audacious goal, or just maybe <laughs> audacious goal would go. I don't know why we have to have Harry in there. Disney is really, <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't have to be Harry. Anyway. <laughs> So the BHAG, what I would say, is way up on the mountain. So we're going to set a BHAG for the company that is usually 10 years or more out. It sounds ludicrous because so many companies came and see the next year, let alone 10, 15 years. Right. Right? So we yeah. set this BHAG, and the BHAG should have about a 30% chance of you actually succeeding at that time. 
right? So you're looking at it and saying, I, I, I don't know how the hell we're going to get there. And, and as you move towards that goal, it's going to require exponential growth in the company, right? So a great example of this is Robert Kennedy, President Kennedy going to the moon, right? 50 years earlier, we just learned how to fly. And now here's this guy getting up on a podium and saying, the United States is going to go to the moon. We're going to bring a man to the moon and bring him back. Sounds ludicrous. We had no technology to do that, right? right? But that inspirational BHAG is what drove the country to grow at that exponential rate. The byproduct was a lot of advances across society. So we take that concept and we bring it down to a company and we say, we're going to be X. Too many companies, in my opinion, will put a revenue goal in there. They'll say, oh, we're a, we're a $5 million company and we're going to get up to $100 million in 10 years. Okay, maybe you will. But is that going to inspire you and your team to get out of bed in the morning and put on their shoes and come to work? Right. Right? Yeah. Probably not because the employees aren't going to really care if you're 5 million or 100 million. They're not going to care. So you got to give them something that they can sink their teeth into that feels like we can we can do this. Now, you don't have to cure cancer, but it's got to be something that feels like meaningful. Nike's BHAG for the longest time was to crush Adidas, right? Like uh-huh. great goal. We're going to work every day because we're going to crush Adidas, right? Or you got Amazon, which was get all of the world's books to anyone on the world in 60 seconds or less. Well, I, they've achieved that a long time ago and they moved on from that. So that's the idea of a BHAG. And when you get that BHAG, you get everybody looking up the mountain in the right direction. And then we set goals along the way for each year, three years. And when I have that, I can go back to the CEO, bringing the conversation back around to the beginning, mm-hmm. go back to the CEO and I can say to the CEO, you're keeping this person on the team. Are they going to help you get to this? Do you see them helping you get to this? And when they can look past it, they can say, no, there's no way they're going to help us get to that. Great. But then do yourself a favor and them a favor, because there's plenty of other places they could go work that they might actually do better at. Let them go and then find somebody else who can help you accelerate to that area. Oh, that's interesting. I like that concept there. I like how you you ask the CEO to be able to reflect themselves to decide whether that person can take them there or not, right? Right. And the reason why I like that is because you're not telling them, right, whether they can or not. They're coming up with their own decision. Mm-hmm. Right, and when and I found when people make up their own decision, that's when they're likely to then take the steps to make things happen. Absolutely, absolutely. I love that approach. I love that approach. Now, George, I know at this point people are thinking, "Oh my goodness, how do I get hold of George? I need to work with him with my business." So, where would they go to connect with you? So, have them go to gmorris.com. That's that's where I'll send anyone. Just go to my website. I got all my socials on there. Reach out to me. You know, I got a WhatsApp set up. So if somebody just wants to shoot me a text and say, hey, I got this concept. Can we jump on the phone for a little while and talk through things with you? Absolutely. Happy to jump on with anyone. Brilliant. Fantastic. And also, um, before we complete this episode, I know you've got a cheeky little gift for everybody. Right. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? A cheeky little gift. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, you just saw the image that came across my head when you said a cheeky gift. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, so the toolbox uh, up on my site, if you go to growth tools up on my website, there's a litany of tools up there that you can use to kind of gauge the business, figure out where things are at with your company. One of the areas I personally like is the quarterly job scorecard. And so you're sitting down with your team and on every quarter you go through each team member and so, okay, if I'm working with you, I say things like, hey, Kay, these are the core values. So what I want to make sure is that you get the core values. Are you living the core values? Are you showing that you understand the core values? And so we're going to go through each of the core values. And then I'm going to go through a thing called GWC. Do you get it? Do you want it? And do you have the capacity to do it? So I want to know that about your job. Get it, want it, capacity to do it. I want to check all the boxes. If I'm not checking the boxes, maybe capacity, you don't have the capacity to do your job. We need to have a conversation about that. And so with this quarterly job scorecard, it drives that conversation. So I can come to UK and say, 
okay, you're kicking ass, you're doing great with the core values, you get it, want it, have the capacity to do it. You're like, great, George, that's awesome. By the way, George, it's my turn now, and I'm going to review you. And so now you turn it back on me and say, George, you know, you're you're living three of the four core values as my manager. You know, you're not really doing this last core value well. And and George, I don't think you get it. You might want your job as manager. You might have the capacity, but I don't think you get it. And now we're going to have a real good conversation, right? And that's part of the, the job scorecard. I can go through all these tools. So if anybody wants to go onto the toolbox and take a look at one of these, um, hit me up with any questions. I'll be glad to help you out. Oh, that is amazing. And guys, I urge you, I urge you to get in contact with George. You know, if you've got any question, no matter how big or small, just ask the question, right? You never know what's going to come out of a conversation. And do go ahead and download that free cheeky little gift, right? You won't be sorry. You're going to learn so much. George, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Oh, my goodness. So many golden nuggets. Thank you, Kay. It's always fun talking to you. Right back at you. Thanks for listening to the Uncensored Society podcast at www.uncensoredsocietypodcast.com. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can get this and every other episode that's coming out. We have lots of great stuff coming, so make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss it. And thank you in advance for all the reviews and comments. I appreciate it so much and I look forward to serving you in next week's episode.